thank you very much maharaj for joining today once again yeah. last two thank podcasts have been me again last two podcasts have been very illuminating and i thought today we could churn the uh, scriptures a bit more and take some more specific themes from scripture and see how we can analyze them from a contemporary perspective if that's okay with you mm. well i i'll <laughs> let's see how it goes for me yes man <laughs> i don't know uh we will we will play it by ear yes man so we thought about the dashavataras which we felt that yeah. they are very prominent in the cultural iconography as well as in the spiritual significance of the in the spiritual significance in the tradition so mm. you know how do how does the modern or the contemporary mind approach them how do we understand them what are their various what are the various layers or levels at which they can be understood so i thought we could discuss the past time as it goes forward and i can raise some questions and i can raise some points and maybe you can also either respond to the questions or add your points okay uh, but um if you don't mind i I'd, i'd like to share uh, a kind of schema which i find helpful for oh, appreciating the bhagavatam in general uh, because for for us uh those who follow the gaudiya vaishnav tradition we take the shrimad bhagavatam or the bhagavat purana as as our central um final final authority uh, based on what jiva goswami shila jiva goswami uh, one of the famous six goswamis of vrindavan uh, in the 16th century wrote in his first the first part of his shat sandarbha the tatva sandarbha he discusses all the different uh, vedic literatures and points out uh what we might call the shortcomings <laughs> and then he he does a process of kind of narrowing down uh to pinpoint the the shrimad bhagavata purana uh which is also called the amala purana the purana with no fault uh the the uh, uh the as the perfect uh scripture so um some time ago i was i i like to th- sometimes i like to make mind maps you know um okay. making drawings with squares and circles and and lines and so on so i found myself making a kind of mind map for the bhagavatam as a whole uh which ended up being just a simple kind of standard form yantra where you have a circle in the center uh and maybe you have some like lotus leaves around the circle uh there will be some bindu in the center and then there will be these uh sort of square sides these these gates uh sort of north south east and west you know okay so i was thinking uh one way obviously prophet said we should discuss bhagavatam from all angles so <laughs> yeah uh, one angle <laughs> one angle for uh appreciating i think the bhagavatam it is um we put the bhagavatam in the center of this yantra it's it's in the circle and then what do we have on the four sides well in my mind i, I put on the bottom so to say the the basis uh or the root uh <clears throat> the vedic literature starting with rig sama yajura tarva veda um you know all all the all the scriptures the the mahabharata the ramayana and also including different puranas uh and of course the bhagavatam itself says nigama kalpa tarar gaditang palam um it identifies itself as the fruit of the nigama um 
uh, that which goes down of the root. The tree is rooted in the in the Vedic Samhitas, and then it comes up. Mm. And then, uh, jumping now to the upper side, Just one let's minute, maybe Maharaj. call it... So when you use the word nigam, you're saying nigam, gum is to go down. So how, are, yeah. how is nigam connected with the Vedas? So yeah, I thought the word nigam itself refers to the Vedas. But you're it saying... Comes that... to, yeah, it comes to refer to Vedic literature in general, it seems. No, so, but then what is the significance of its moving down so that... Uh, the idea of roots, the, the whole image we have is of a tree. Okay. A tree Salpatalu. has roots. Okay. Yeah. And okay, then... So that, what then goes down fruit. is the Vedic, And what comes up is the, is the Bhagavatam. Kalpataro or Galitam Phalam. Oh. Right. Okay, I didn't <laughs> think of it that way. I just thought of Kalpataro as the whole desire tree, but... It talks about roots and, and fruits. Beautiful. Okay, thank you, Maharaj. Well, the, the point I want to make, but I'll get to that in a minute, is it's, the Bhagavatam is, is very inclusive. Okay. Uh, okay, so then on the northern side, the upper side, um, we have our own tradition, Gaudiya Vaishnavism, beginning with Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, and then uh, the text... Uh, or the texts which he inspired, uh, mm -hmm. specifically all of the writings of the Goswamis, okay. uh, Krishnadas Kaviraj, um, Rindavandas Thakur, and and then going on to the all the way to, up to the to the present uh, with Srila Prabhupada and his commentary uh, translation and commentary to the Bhagavatam. Mm. And a major focal point in that upper area, we can say, is Chaitanya Charitamrita, because Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is um, what I like to call the ideal reader of the Bhagavatam. Okay. Um, you get this in, in literary theory, uh, the uh, the idea that uh, an author is writing a book with some idea in mind of his or her ideal reader, someone who can really appreciate what they're writing. Uh, so the ideal reader in this case, we can say, is Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, who is not, of course, just sitting and reading. He's living the Bhagavatam. He is the, there's the book Bhagavatam and the person Bhagavatam, and he is the uh, primordial person Bhagavatam, being none other than Krishna himself. So he's hearing about himself. <laughs> and then the whole Chaitanya Charitamrita is really, uh, can be read as an extended commentary on the Bhagavatam. Extended commentary on the Bhagavatam. Okay. I think Prabhupada in the introduction of the Bhagavatam also puts in Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. You know, yes, so. he tells the a whole uh, biography yeah. summary. Okay. Yeah. And Chaitanya Charitamrita is not just like a book of philosophy. It's more like a biography Present, it's more like a book of theology presented in the mode of a biography. So it's both, yeah. you can say in a sense that it's both the book Bhagavat and the teaching, it, it's like a book which is uh, describing the person Bhagavat and the teachings of that person Bhagavat, which we could say is the book Bhagavat. So that's a beautiful yeah. way of looking at it, yes. So that's the yeah. Nathan. It's a Gaudiya and, but you, can also, you can also say that the Chaitanya Charitamrita is um, it's the, the boiled down essence. You know, the Bhagavatam is the fruit. Okay. Uh, uh, the Galitam Palam. Yeah. And then when you take that ripe fruit, uh, you can make a nice chutney. <laughs> okay, beautiful. Yeah. I think Prabhupada also talked about a hierarchy that Bhagavad Gita is like the undergraduate study and then uh, 
भगवत गाइज मैं स्कूल लेवल भागवत में कॉलेज लेवल एंड चैतन चरित डॉक्टरेट लेवल post graduate yeah post graduate yeah, doctor yeah post graduate level so yeah on another way i have heard about this similar hierarchy is that the bhagavad gita talks about the identity of god who is god is identified in the gita then the activity of god is talked about in the bhagavatam and the mentality or the heart of god how god yeah. thinks is depicted in the chaitanya charitamrit so of course we cannot make it how god it. thinks and how god thinks and how god feels <laughs> oh yes yeah. so yeah mind includes both yeah that's true <laughs> yeah so all these things uh are 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 relevant so but my point is we're we're trying to picture now uh a sort of a yantra and we have yeah. t- we have two sides now uh we have all this vedic literature on one side and we have all the commentaries from our tradition on the other side mm. uh then you may ask so then what about the the left side and the right side the the west and the east side mm. so my proposal and it's just one way of thinking of the bhagavatam but on on one on one side i think of it as the east side you could switch all these around but on the east side we have ourselves um with our own reading experience and everything else uh hearing from our gurus the sadhus we we hear we hear a lot of bhagavatam classes <laughs> and and we're also bringing everything with us that we have from our backgrounds and okay we can say well we don't we're not interested in that that's all that's what we want to get purified from and so on um yes but we're also in, we're also individuals yeah. and there's uh some relevance to our experience in that as we are reading the bhagavatam what is it that we take from the bhagavatam for our lives that's, that's cool. important for us and we're also communicating with others that's true i think in your constructive theologizing paper you mentioned this point that in a sense every reader is at one level an interpreter because every reader takes something from the scripture and then yeah. they apply it individually so right. you, so in that sense it's true yeah, this is makes sense and we have our intellectual yeah. world view world view we have there's so many things that have influenced us that shape how we yeah. look at the scriptures okay yeah uh <clears throat> that's fascinating yeah. so we could say more about that but let's go to, let's continue with my yantra yes. what is it on the west side the left side this is the entire body of religious literature from other traditions which have any notion of of god and the reason i mention this or why i include this is because of one conversation shila prabhupad uh spoke well it was the end of one of his lectures it was in 1969 in los angeles at the end of a lecture prabhupad invited questions and one unidentified lady uh asked shila prabhupad what about joan of arc joan of arc was a yes a 15th century uh f- french um woman who became a saint uh she was a hero uh, of the french for, she was fighting against the british <laughs> against the english uh and she became uh i guess canonized as a saint so this lady as probably what about joan of arc <laughs> and 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 she asked him do you know who is joan of arc <laughs> and probably said yes i know <laughs> you know he was educated at scottish church college so 
he would have known. And he said, basically, yes, um, she is, um, this is also Bhagavatam. If it's uh, connected with uh, God consciousness, that is also Bhagavatam. Something mm -hmm. like that, he said. Yeah, I think and Prabhupada he, said, sorry, please. Prabhupada said that, he didn't elaborate at that time. But to me, this is a, a very important clue to understand, um, to appreciate more deeply uh, the, the, the Bhagavatam proper, so to say, the specific Sanskrit text uh, in, the, in, in the sense when Srila Prabhupada at least one time said, he gave as a translation of Srimad Bhagavatam, the title, he said, the beautiful story of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Hmm. <laughs> yeah. I think Prabhupada said something similar about St. Francis of Assisi. And Prabhupada heard that he talked about like uh, sister wind and brother mountain and uh, mm, like yeah. like basically like a sibling or a family relationship with nature Prabhupada was very appreciative of that and Prabhupada said that is also God consciousness I don't know whether he used the word yeah. Bhagavatam in that context but Prabhupada was quite appreciative yeah. yeah okay so this is so are we considering this as different ways of approaching the Bhagavatam say it's like the Vedic Gaudiya you could say theistic an individual. Are, are, are these different ways of looking at the Bhagavatam or are these just different uh, means what, what is the yantra meant to convey? Uh, for me it's just opening up uh, yes to, to look at the Bhagavatam from different angles um, and, and each of these are I want to say that they're all relevant uh, for us to have a fuller experience uh, of, of what the Bhagavatam is. And it helps us to understand or appreciate the Bhagavatam in a non-sectarian way. Oh, okay, beautiful. So say, if you want to consider the concept, the Bhagavatam's description of Krishna as the ultimate reality, then we could say, consider, you know, Okay, what is said about Krishna in the Bhagavatam? And then we see how that relates with the conception of divinity in the Vedic literature or how that is elaborated on the Gaudiya tradition or how that relates with, uh, relates with uh, other theistic traditions overall. Right. And then we could also approach it, you know, okay, what do we think about it? How do, what, what speaks to us? Or what? Exactly. Okay. Yeah. And we can also, with regard to other... Um, religious or spiritual literature, uh, it may be of, of value for communicating about the Bhagavatam to, to be aware uh, of, uh, of one cannot be knowledgeable about all the literature, that's a vast literature, but one can be knowledgeable of certain things and point out uh, possible connections, possible comparisons. Uh, one devotee pointed out to me the other day, we, uh, we have the story of, the, of Anti Brahmana in the 11th canto mm. and how he loses everything. He becomes completely destitute materially. That's and then the how, he, how he goes from there. So... So there's a story in the Hebrew Bible, one, uh, one Job, of the Job. books, it's called the Book of Job. Job, yeah, Book of Job, yeah. It's, and Job similarly loses everything. He becomes diseased. Everything goes wrong. And then, you know, the question is, is he going to blame God for this or what? <laughs> and eventually yeah. he has... Uh, he gets, uh, he hears directly from God, mm. who tells him, basically kind of says, who do you think you are? You're just a little guy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you have no idea. You have no idea, you know, who I am. <laughs> but there's, you know, there's some comparison there. And there's been a huge amount of 
commentarial literature on the book of Job. Yeah. And some of that just might be interesting to consider um, with respect to the Bhagavatam or with respect to this story like that. Yeah, that's true. So this is all, I've, I've just, you know, kind of roughly sketched this. I, I haven't developed it, but I, um, I think it can be useful. Yes, man, this, this is very, it's at least visually very clear and it opens new vistas for us to analyze and discuss. So applying that to analyze to analyze but also to appreciate devotionally enter into because that's what we really want isn't it okay. uh, we want to devotionally enter into the bhagavatam i was just reading um there's a, a collect, collection of excerpts of lectures by uh uh Srila bhakti siddhanta sarasati thakur it's been translated from the Bengali to English. Uh, the book is called Srimad Bhagavat Tatparya. And I just read uh, at one point, Siddhanta Thakur, Saraswati Thakur says, we cannot understand the Bhagavatam uh, even after millions of lives. <laughs> My and, God. Unless, millions of lives. Unless we, sur- he's, He's saying, unless we surrender to the Lord, we can. <laughs> oh, okay. But um, I, I think this helps us again, especially I'm thinking how to how to break through our tendency toward a kind of sectarian uh, mentality to okay. to help uh, to connect for ourselves to enter, but also to connect others with the Bhagavatam. Yes, Maharaj. Okay, so now I just had, I was thinking of approaching this also not from such a visually clear path. Yeah, yeah. But I was thinking more yeah. that if we study the Bhagavatam, say we could discuss how say something like the say traditional and uh, the academic perspectives of looking at something. So maybe more like a, if a rational way, if you look at it, what all, what all could be the objections that come up from it? And then traditionally, <laughs> what, are the, what are the focuses? What are the things that are learned from it? Or what, what is, and what we could look at it from mm. that way. So we could put mm. that in the schema in, the, as individuals, we have certain questions that might come up. And uh, yeah. as you said, we, re, we represent, we, we, have, we bring our uh, intellectual, <clears throat> cultural, and various other influences into how <clears throat> we look at it. Yes. Yes, of course. And entering into it is, it it is relishable. So that's what we want to do, of course. And so now, uh, should we start with Matsya Maharaj? Yes. Why not? Yes. Thank you. So <laughs> now, the first question that uh, I mean comes up to a rational mind is mm. you know is this literal that you know, there is a small fish that becomes huge and then there is always the you know to the, to the western mind or to the modern mind there is often the idea that there is this either anthropomorphism or zoomorphism that mm-hmm. is this imagery of god in animals and things like that so yeah. so now, Teriomorphism. One, so, sorry? Teriomorphism. <laughs> Terio is terrestrial forms? In various... No, terio means animals. Oh, zoomorphism is also that, no? Or... Um, oh, um, oh, maybe. I, now I'm not so sure. <laughs> okay. Maybe both. <laughs> Have to look it up. <laughs> yeah, I guess. Okay, theriomorphism, the identification of animal characteristics of the supernatural being. Okay, and uh, zoomorphism, at least. Uh, I think that zoomorphism 
refers it it refers not just to i think it's not so much about uh god it can refer to anything which you attribute attribute animal characteristics so it's oh right uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. yes maharaj <laughs> <laughs> so now yeah you know that bhakti siddhant so thakur in a rough way mm. give some kind of correlation between the dashavataras and the and evolution at his time i did not was his... it bhakti siddhant thakur first or was it bhakti vinod thakur oh i read bhagavan bhakti siddhant you might be right i i'm not sure now myself yeah. um in any case yeah. yeah there is there is that it's a kind of uh yeah giving a kind of darwinian spin if you like <laughs> yeah that's true so <laughs> to the you know development of the avatars yeah cuz baktino thakur i read your analysis of baktino thakur's that essay on the bhagavat and right. uh, it is very good essay and i think that you talked at least in that he talks you analyze how he addresses three things what all are the obstacles that the contemporary mind might find at first is the cosmology and the uh, cosmology and the and the geography history geography coin history basically then the second is the ethics that say krishna dances with other women's wives and something like that other men's wives and then the the whole theology aspect itself so i don't remember this darwinian spin being talked about over there no i didn't mention it in that article in any case I think the th- the first of the three obstacles um was just the difficulty of the Bhagavatam it's it's difficult to read it's difficult sanskrit and so on oh uh, and and then and then uh, was the difficulty of cosmology and so on as you said and then yes the difficulty of the ethics yes um yeah so that was and baktivinod takur of course was um acutely conscious of this tension with modern thinking what he called adunikavad mm and the reason he was so conscious was because uh the social scene in which he found himself because of his his work as a um a district magistrate was uh this um sort of class of edu- of modern educated uh bengalis that came to be known as the badralok yeah you know the 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 good folks or something <laughs> that were uh, specifically trained um by the british to to take responsibilities for for governance and so on yeah. and all these people um the the tight guys the mentality they had at the time was you know forget about all this strange stories of puranas mm. and of course they were being very much influenced also by the brahmo samaj <clears throat> uh the brahmo samaj of um what's his name i'm forgetting at the moment yes raj <clears throat> ram mohan um which in turn was influenced <laughs> by uh the unitarians of uh of england uh some of them who came to india the unitarians were uh as a quite radical christian group and they were called unitarians um as opposed to trinitarians they rejected the idea of the christian idea of the trinity hmm. and said no uh there is a singularity there is one god and uh jesus is a great saint no doubt but he's not on the level with god anyway so that influence uh, this sort of chain of influences was there which was leading 
uh, his uh, colleagues to reject Vedic literature in general, Puranic literature uh, in favor of, you know, all kinds of uh, Western writing and so on. And so Bhaktivinoda Thakur is saying, hey, wait, 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 don't, don't throw, don't throw this away. You're, you're rejecting uh, the profound wisdom of the Bhagavatam. Mm. Uh, and, and, uh, and that's because you are, he, he calls them shallow readers. They are shallow readers. They just read the surface and they don't go into the depth. Um, yeah, so that's true. So that that was 1869, 1868. I think he gave the speech. Um, I don't know, in 69, 68, 69 it was one of the first things that he wrote as uh, in, in the spirit of Vaishnava uh, preaching. Yeah, and and so. My point is just this um, concern for how do we relate our literature, specifically the Bhagavatam, to modern thinking. That question goes back to at least that time. But we can go back even further, if we like. Um, there was one uh, sort of l lower level English judge in Calcutta in the late uh, 18th century, Sir William Jones. Oh, he was a pioneer of the study of Sanskrit, isn't it, in some ways? He was, yeah. He was, he was a pioneer of uh, the, the, modern, uh, the, the modern study called philology, the study of languages and their history. Okay. And he's the one credited with seeing the connection between Sanskrit and um, Latin, Greek, and so on. Anyway, he, he, was, uh, he also founded the Royal Asiatic Society. Um, but he also wrote several essays, and one essay he wrote, uh, and this brings us to more specific topic of Matsya. Mm -hmm. He wrote about Matsya Avatar okay. in one essay, and his perspective as, as a good Christian <laughs> was that... Uh, Ark? Huh? Did he compare with the Noah Ark? Like yeah, that. he made a comparison with the story of Noah and the ark. Oh. But his perspective was that the story of Noah and the ark is straight history. Okay. And, and the Bhagavatam is a distortion, a degradation uh, of the original story, which he felt was uh, what's found in the Bible. <laughs> okay, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Now, speaking of that story, uh, just one this... minute, Maharaj, if you don't mind. Yeah. Because you're talking about the uh, Bhaktivinoda Thakur's uh, addressing this tension. So, in some yeah. ways, I think he redefines the terms Kanishta Madhyamya Uttama. I think he does that more in Krishna Samhita than in the Bhagavata essay. But I thought maybe that, if I understand this right, I thought that that could be a frame we could use over here. I think he talks about the literal, just those who insist on the lit, every, reading everything literally as the Kanishta. And mm -hmm. then he talks about, he places the most of the Bhadraloka thinking uh, at the level of Madhyama. So he talks about uh -huh. more or less the rational, national people who want to look for some metaphorical meaning or who want to look for some ethical teachings or something like yeah. that in the Madhyama yeah. level. And in a sense, he's patting them on the back. Yes, you are better than literalists. But right. then he says there is a level higher also. And that yeah. is the Rasika or the transcendental level. So where yeah. it's more of uh, developing a developing devotion and experiencing Rasa. Yes. So I think that is a frame we could also use for looking at uh, the 
at the the shaltaras isn't it yes that's good um thank you for reminding me it's been quite a while since i read that <laughs> yes, yes that's useful um but anyway going back to flood you know there's <clears throat> There's flood literature all over the world. The world is flooded with flood okay. stories. Okay. <laughs> and that has led all kinds of researchers to try to understand why that's the case. Mm -hmm. And so there have been theories, you know, archaeologists, um, I don't know, paleontologists, uh, geologists who are trying to see was you know, where have there been uh, inundations in the past or where can we see evidence of um, high, high water <laughs> on what is now land and so on. And you can see there are videos on YouTube with uh, things about that. That's interesting. So there, the point is, <clears throat> there's an attempt to make some connection uh, with what uh, now in modern time we could call history, that there's some historical event happening and then that is uh, experienced or, or it's remembered over many generations mm. and then the memory after so many generations, so the, so the reasoning goes, uh, develops into a whole story. Mm. In the Old Testament, it, it comes in the, as the story of Noah and the ark. Um, in the Bhagavatam, it comes as the story of Satyavrata and, uh, and Matsyavatar and so on. Mm. So Maharaj, um, a, sorry, there is a go ahead. relatively influential contemporary thinker jordan peterson you know he yes he's all over the internet now yeah. isn't he <laughs> he has done a series of uh, talks on psychological significance of biblical tales or biblical stories and uh, mm. it seems that he's like his two two and a half hour lectures he gives and he he analyzes everything in quite an interesting way and it seems that he He's attracted even non-theists to start reading the Bible. He says this is not, gotcha. not, not necessarily read it as a religious book, but yeah. it, has, it has various different ways in which you can look at it. So yeah, now, I know he's I know he's been making that point that the Bible is great literature. There are other scholars also. They say, you know, um, if you really go into it. Uh, it's it's some of the best literature there ever was. <laughs> so so now I I don't remember everything that he says, but I I love I had looked at his talk on the floods, and he gives a very interesting significance which could relate with what what Matsya says. He says that basically uh, there is an existential struggle between humanity and nature. That nature we often in today's world we try to portray as nature as good and human culture has destroyed nature but it's not necessarily like that that you know human culture is often simply an attempt to protect oneself from being destroyed by nature there are floods and there are droughts and there are earthquakes so there are times when nature overpowers human beings and now that may happen because of human incompetence in, in the measures to defend oneself, or it could happen just because nature is extremely powerful. And at that time, there is, when nature overpowers humans, then at that time, humans need to turn to something bigger than themselves. And that, that intervention of something bigger than themselves, that happens by, if the humans will be able to access that, if they have prepared their heart for it. That means it says throughout your life, he doesn't bring God into the picture. And when he's asked whether you believe in God, he, he says the concept of God is so complex that uh, I can't answer this question. <laughs> but, but what he says is something where it, he, maybe it's a strategic position because as soon as he brings in God, he will lose a lot of people. 
<laughs> yeah. But it could be philosophical also. It's just. But what he says is, yeah. throughout your life, whenever you have at every such at every major crossroads in your life, you have to, you can either choose to act virtuously, you can act according to your higher nature, or you can act according to your lower nature. And through each mm-hmm. of these choices, you are preparing yourself. And if you have prepared yourself by acting responsibly, then at the time when this adversity breaks out, you, know, you will have the resources to access the higher nature. And then right. whatever it is you want to call the universe or something else, it will come to your help. So mm. then he goes into the specifics of the story of uh, Noah Ark and how unlikely everything was that happened. And he was old and then he got a child and then he was told he had to go away and build a boat. And so he did all that. So there is, so that we, we can go to specifics later, but I thought this thing about uh, humanity, nature, and then by regular high, regular good choices, one can access some power higher than oneself or higher even than nature. Hmm? That is a, that is an interesting schema, which, which we, which can be, yeah. re, which can be interesting or relevant. Yeah, we might want to bring in the term samskara here. When we make a good choice, that is a kind of samskara, uh, an imprint on our consciousness. It's a habit formation, Mm -hmm. if you like. Uh, And of course, uh, this this reaching for higher power, uh, this is where uh, the the directions, uh, the ways part of the theists and the non-theists, where the theists say there is a, not just a higher power, but a higher power full. And the non-theist says, or the uh, materialist maybe I should say, uh, says, well, then it's just your imagination. It's your projection. I think we talked about that before, projection and reception. Yes. So they say, well, that's just your projection, and therefore you're creating these stories. <laughs> All right. But there's one thing also we could say that, you know, science itself or the rational approach, at best, what it can be non-theistic. It, we cannot rationally establish atheism as much as we can't rationally, conclusively establish theism. So we can say that we don't know enough. Uh, we don't know enough to be pessimistic about the existence of a higher power also. <laughs> <laughs> that would be taking the humble position which the atheist could take advantage of and say, ah, you don't know enough, but I know enough. <laughs> yeah, that's possible. But I think Richard Dawkins also, when he made those buses, he had put some posters on the buses in UK. So yeah. he thought he had, there probably is no God. Stop worrying and enjoy life. <laughs> so then he said, probably because he said, I'm not, a, the, I'm not like a irrational atheist. So he says, you know, you can never know conclusively, but on a spectrum of no existence of God and non-existence of God, so the unlikelihood of the existence of God is very high. Likelihood is very low. That was his conclusion. Yeah. But so that was his conclusion. Yeah. Um, of course, Blaise Pascal had a different idea. Yeah, that's true. You know, Pascal's wager. Yeah. <laughs> I think he said it was pretty much 50-50, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, he said, and so, in fact, if you draw four quadrants, like God exists and you believe in him. God exists and you don't believe in him. God doesn't exist yeah. so, and you believe in him. God doesn't exist and you don't believe in him. So he, he says that yeah. <laughs> you won't lose. Because even if he doesn't exist and you believe in him, still you will have lived ethically and you would have lived in a way that is regulated and... Uh, that is going to, that will help you to be happy and help others to be, and it will contribute to society. I think God yes. has changed. And ultimately, no loss. <laughs> yeah. But he says, if God exists and you don't believe in him, there'll be a big loss. <laughs> <laughs> but what has changed, I think, since then is that 
there are so many more sensual ways of enjoying and also the idea of religion leading to various kinds of extremism has come to the fore so whether religion really helps people to live better uh, improve the, that that question has become a little debated although overall yeah. it has seemed to be a positive influence but quite often the negative influences of religion are much more portrayed in the media and so here may be the point where we want to sort of uh, make a shift from using the language of religion to using the language of spirituality. Okay. Um, yes. Because it's, you know, it's the popular idea now. I'm spiritual but not religious. S-B-E-N-R. It's an official category yes, that's in true. some surveys. Um, which, of course, begs the question, what do you mean by spiritual? And, but what I like to say for that is, what I mean by spiritual is uh, bhakti. And um, what is the Bhagavatam? And, and then within our Bhagavatam language, we can say dharma uh, is kind of, we can equate with religion, religious. And then what does um, Sutta Goswami say? Savai Pung Sang Paro Dharmo. Ito Bhakti Radhokchanjay. He gives as the highest religion as, bhak, as Bhakti. And so he's speaking about the connection between religion and spirituality. But uh, I think it's something to explore that we may, it may help people to appreciate um, our tradition if we put a bit more emphasis on the notion of bhakti as spirituality, yes. maybe even in contrast to religion and dharma. And of course, what does Krishna say at the end of the Gita? Sarva dharma and prityaja, mamekam sharanam raja. So that lines up very well with <laughs> saying, uh, yes, I'm spiritual, but not religious. <laughs> yes, well, that's true. You know, one way... And in relation back to, back to Matsya... Yeah, just one minute to apply this principle of sorry. Spiritual, yeah. spiritual and religious. One way I try to differentiate, now this is not a watertight differentiation, but when people talk about religious, they are talking more in terms of, say, dogmas and rituals. What you are supposed to believe yeah. and what you are supposed to go through and do, often mindlessly. And they see both of yeah. those as negative. Whereas when they talk about yeah. spiritual, they usually talk about either virtues or attitudes, like forgiveness, gratitude, open-mindedness, and then they talk about experiences. If you're spiritual, you experience right. some sense of connectedness, some higher reality. And so, and so those, yeah. if you look at the Bhagavatam, the Bhagavatam is not so much about either dogmas or rituals. It is indeed more about the characteristics of sadhu or virtues, titikshava karunika, yeah. you know, which is yes. any, any spiritual but not religious kind of person will also appreciate those qualities. Right. And then the verse you quoted, it is an experience of God. You know, that, that yeah. God, so in that sense, positioning bhakti as spiritual is, uh, so often I say it's bhakti is spiritual and religious, but it's spiritual first. Because we also have certain practices, yeah. but yeah, we could position that as spiritual and uh, we could analyze it. Yes, Maharaj. Yeah, the, uh, you mentioned two aspects of religion that people don't like. There's, I would say there's a third one, and that is institutionalization yeah. or institutions, organization. Um, especially in the West, everyone wants to be independent. They want to uh, decide for themselves and so on. Anyway, that's, that's a whole other thing. But uh, I wanted to get back to Matsya yes, of course. <laughs> in relation to Bhakti. Yeah. And say that one thing uh, that strikes me about this narrative in the Bhagavatam is that Matsyavatar initially puts himself into a position of dependence on mm -hmm. Satyavrata Muni. 
Mm. which means that the relationship, the rasa, uh, we may say is a kind of vatsalya, mm. where Satyavrata is protecting this poor little fish. <laughs> yeah. And of course, then, then, the, then the fish gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And there's some interesting comparisons to be made there. And eventually, um, uh, the, the king realizes, oh, this could only be the Supreme Personality of God. And then he's offering his respects. And then, of course, mm, Matsyavatar is now in the superior position. And it's kind of an, 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 a rever- um, inversion because now uh, Matsyavatar is protecting Satyavrata. Mm-hmm. Yes. It's also Vatsalya. Um, as I remember, somewhere somewhere in the seventh canto, uh, in speaking about Pr- Sri Prahlad, Prahlad Maharaj and um, Singhadev, if I remember correctly, Prabhupada mentions that Vatsalya Rasa goes both ways in the sense we generally think it means uh, the feeling of being the Lord's guardian or protector, but it can also be the feeling of the devotee as being dependent on the Lord, the Lord being the guardian. Yeah. But what's interesting in the Matsya story is that both are there. <laughs> it's the same. <laughs> That's it's true. the same. It's the same Lord. It's the same devotee. And the relationship uh, gets switched around. That's so true. So, and so the- I think that goes into the category you mentioned, uh, Madhyama. That goes up now, speaking about rasa, the Bhagavatam. This is now the, uh, the, the Uttama platform where, where one relishes. And this is also this is a beautiful frame that normally in the conventional religious path, we first approach God as the father, as the protector. Oh, Father, thou art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And then in some, some, some spiritual paths, we might evolve to a level where we see that God, God is dependent on us. So that would be the normal hierarchy that God is our protector to we become our God's protector. But in this particular story, right. the hierarchy is inverted. It's the other way around. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I got in trouble once. Oh, go go ahead. No, no, you can say. I, I finish this point. Yeah. No, you finish, please. Oh, so no, I I was going to make a different point. I just you you mentioned something. You can you can mention it. Yeah. No, this is just a little um, interlude. Many years ago, I was giving a talk. Uh, it was a public lecture. A small, uh, maybe there were thirty people in the room here in Poland. And I was, um, I was being a little bit derisive about this idea of praying to God for our daily bread. Mm. You know, I was saying, you know, because Prabhupada sometimes would say like that, you know. Yeah. This is a very low level of, of religion. So I was, I was kind of falsely imitating Srila Prabhupada. And... Uh, you know, Poland is a very strongly Roman Catholic country, yeah. <laughs> and more strongly uh, back then when I was speaking. So someone really objected when I said that. Said, you know, this is, uh, yeah, they took, they they were offended by that. So one has to be careful. <laughs> That's interesting. This happened with me in India also once. That I I maybe also did something similar. I said that when you're praying to God for bread, it shows your love for bread, not love for God. So I put it <laughs> like that. And then most devotees laughed at it. But then afterward, one devotee came and he said, you know, I had brought a friend of mine. He's, he's from a Christian background. He'd come, you know, why do you have to criticize Christianity? And then he said, yeah. actually, in their tradition, they, he was saying that they interpret bread in a very broad way. That, and he was yeah. saying that bread is what sustains our existence, not just physically, but in all ways. Yeah. 
So it, that yeah. could be interpreted at different levels also. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. so yes, Maharaj. So now regarding this uh, point of uh, the rasa being inverted, so it's interesting that uh, that this among the ten adashavtaras, in if we consider from the point of view of that, generally humanity turns towards divinity. Generally, because something gets disrupted in the normal way of things. If we are just going through a normal life, okay, maybe there is some God and I will occasionally worship him, but we don't really turn our heart towards God. So it's only when some major disruption happens in our normal way of living, then we say, okay, I cannot cope with life as it is right now. And I need some, some higher intervention or some higher power. So that's when the wholehearted mm. turning towards uh, uh, God, God comes up. You know, like, say, I say that it's sometimes like, for many people, God is like the spare wheel in their life, and in crisis, <laughs> in crisis, he becomes like the steering wheel. Then you know, you you take me where I want, what what I should do. So it's one part of. So then, <laughs> the spare wheel. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So that's the first time I've heard that analogy. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, it's, I believe it is a backup plan, but it's not of much interest to me right now. I'm not an atheist, but I don't want to be devoted to God. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. among the Bhagavatam various uh, avatars, if we can consider in the, I think it's a Greek, Greek category or two categorization of evil as natural evil and uh, what is it? Human evil or he talks about uh, yeah, the, how nature might bring problems upon us or people might do bad things and problems might come upon us. Right. In the Bhagavatam, this is the, this is the only pastime where, it's, where the adversity that is coming, there is no conscious agent behind it. Otherwise, each pastime we have some demon. We have mm. Hiranyaksha, we have Hiranyakashipu, we have Ravan and everyone else. Now, hmm. of course, in the case of Kalki, there is not one, it said many demons are there. Or the kings in yeah. general become demoniac. Parshuram also, there is one Kartevir Arjuna. But it seems that in this case, the evil is not uh, presented as one person. It's just nature is, the, the, the cause of that flood is not mentioned. It's just that flood comes, or the, the devastation yeah, comes. Because, because it's time for it to come. <laughs> it's it's the time for pralaya. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so time but, for uh, to, yeah. Yeah. This idea you mentioned, there's no regarding nature in the Bhagavatam. I I wrote, I I did a presentation on this many years ago, at the uh, World Sanskrit Conference. Well, that's a whole other subject, but. Um, no, I'm sorry. This was something else. I did something on humor in the Bhagavatam. Nature in the Bhagavatam, I wrote an article. Uh, basically, up to 10th canto, nature is attractive and dangerous. Okay. <laughs> it's the- attractive. It's my, you know, it's, it's uh, the, 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 the best... Example is uh, Gajendra entering into this beautiful pool okay. uh, to enjoy with his wives. And then the crocodile comes. So that's, and, and it's describing that lake. It's a very beautiful place. Hmm. So nature is beautiful, it's attractive and dangerous. Um, and of course, this equates or it ties into the Bhagavatam's uh, general presentation again up to the tenth canto of of the feminine of women in relation to men who are pursuing spiritual life. In other words, they're attractive and they're dangerous. <laughs> yeah, that's striking <laughs> parallel. So, although Maya is. Uh, Although you could say Maya is uh, energy, it's not necessarily equal to women. Maya can be come in many forms, and Bhagavatam also says for uh, women, man can be Maya. 
but still you are talking about overall portrayal of nature yeah. and portrayal of women yeah that is true and it's interesting when you talk about attractive and dangerous if we consider the fourth canto prutu maharaj pastime there its nature is the earth is portrayed as a cow and you know, cow is even not just sensually attractive but it is you could say religiously attractive yet it is not giving um, the food and in that sense it is it is harmful so it's mm-hmm. not so much temptation over there but it's more in the form of tribulation that is coming yeah although um yes the cow is of course a kind of in one sense a kind of different tattva somewhere between nature and and humanity uh as i see it the way it's pr- represented in that particular place and um maybe also in the first canto uh with maras prichit yes i have to think about it but um from what i was reading in preparing to write my book on cows this is this struck me very much cows and i met people also uh when i was doing my interviewing in india uh for this book uh people who were champions of cow production they would say cow is not an animal <laughs> oh okay cow is something more than cow is cow is divinity you know they always like to quote uh that uh the cow embodies all of the demigods and so on mm okay so i think i mean that uh, that's a big subject and that's interesting that's another subject <laughs> yeah i would love to discuss that maybe it will come in one of the avatars if we get to them yeah but uh, uh, it's my so then this uh, idea yeah. that in each of the avatars there is some kind of disruption of normal life and krishna also says that when dharmasya glani happens that's when i descend yes so now there is prior to this so i was just trying to place this in a broader framework that yeah. is there is much description of satyavrat you know obviously it seems that after when he starts offering prayers and everything he recognizes this is the supreme lord so he is he is a devotee but is there any further description of him you know you're talking earlier about the dependence so when that fish came he could easily have neglected that fish but he, right. he he gave protection so that also indicates his uh, his compassionate or at least considerate nature and then he went out of his way to because the fish was becoming bigger and bigger and he had to make arrangements for it and he kept yeah. doing that and eventually then that as because in a sense he went through all the trouble to try to protect the fish and then the fish protected him so right so there must be some bhakti already there yeah yes. that's true <laughs> um but there's also i'm just thinking aloud here um and trying to make a little connection possible connection to the prophetic traditions sometimes uh the the jewish christian and islamic traditions are sort of put together sometimes they're called simply abrahamic traditions yeah. because they all kind of stem from abraham but also they're uh called the prophetic traditions because uh there's a pattern that god chooses someone to be his representative um despite that person's lack of qualifications and oh. even despite resisting to take that uh that position that duty uh and so i'm wondering here if matsya avatar is in a sense choosing satyavrata okay <laughs> that's interesting but of course there's another interesting element here um we don't usually talk about but uh, th- we have the idea of a ti- a little fish speaking <laughs> first of all we don't usually think of fish speaking 
And it seems we have a fish uh, that's not only speaking, but speaking perfect Sanskrit. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's true. To which we may say, well, of course, if he's God, uh, what else would you expect? Certainly he's going to. But Satyavrata, hearing a little fish speaking Sanskrit, <laughs> might be wondering, <laughs> what's going on here? <laughs> yeah. There is this... Um, there is this whole idea that, you know, maybe that people in the past, they were not as rational as they were. And that's why they believed all kinds of stories. But now we are rational and uh, we, we, we don't believe this. We are skeptical about these things. That is one idea. But yeah. then it, when, when I'm asked this question, I say that, uh, you know, we see rationality even in the Bhagavatam. Say, for example, when Krishna lifts Govardhan Hill, at that time, after the Rajwasi is asked, and there's a whole chapter, the Rajwasi is asking, how could Krishna lift it? Yeah. And then when he says that actually I was told that Gargamuni had told that he is as good as Narayan. Gargamuni doesn't exactly say that he's Narayan, but he, something says like that. He's empowered by Narayan, he's as good as Narayan. And the Rajwasi yeah. accept it. So that means that they don't, they are not naive to accept any story. They also know that there is yeah. a rational order to the world, but right. they also, they're open to recognizing that this rational order can be superseded by certain higher powers. Super so, rational. Yeah. yeah. Super rational. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, so in that sense, uh, now there are some cases where, where even ordinary animals seem to be speaking. Like Gajendra is composing prayers in Sanskrit. And right. we have the Vanaras uh, speaking in the Ramayana. So yeah. in some ways, the modern approach is that the Mahabharata seems to be much more believable because it doesn't have things like talking animals and stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> but the Vanaras also are said to be an evolved species. Sometimes they're compared to monkeys. But they are said to be like a almost celestial kind of apes. So maybe they Yeah, have... well, there's, there's, there's a whole de debate uh, I remember reading among the scholars of the Ramayana. What actually means Vanara? What is a Vanara? It's not exactly... Uh, they, they are very... Sus they don't want to just say, oh, it's a monkey. No, there must be something more than that. Mm. I think the etymology also means va nara. Is this a human? Because they very strikingly resemble <laughs> humans. Well, that's yeah. Okay, maybe. <laughs> the, the, that's called uh, folk etymology. That's oh, really? uh, something. Yeah, that's something that would uh, very quickly be dismissed <laughs> oh, okay. by a standard scholar. But um, but they're a lot of fun. These uh, folk etymologies. <laughs> okay, <laughs> interesting. So folk etymology is also something which is sometimes used by our tradition. I think the word asura is also used in that sense sometimes. That. Uh, uh, no, I think the original is Ashura, that one who enjoys in the body that which breathes. Is Again, folk, folk thing, etymology. That is also folk etymology. Okay. Yeah. The one who enjoys it's the generally understood that the word Asura uh, comes from Persian. Uh, Asura Mazda. Oh, okay. Where for them, the, the devas... Uh, for the Persian civilization, it was Asura were the devas, <laughs> and then you know for the for uh, south south of uh, the or in southwest, in other words, in present day India, mm. um, they put it the other way around. You know, all of this is um, certainly speculative. We can't say, but yeah. Um, there is pretty commonly that connection made, as far as I remember. Okay. Asura with Persian. Yeah, okay. Uh, maybe two, three quick points I'll mention. So one is that the idea of talking animals doesn't seem to startle anyone in the scriptures, as far as we see. 
So right, it's that okay. They're talking, so there could be <laughs> there could. It seems that the that the boundaries between either various species or various levels of reality, like the celestial and the terrestrial and the celestial, or between the human and the animals, these boundaries are not that uh, rigid. They seem to be somewhat porous, and animals have human attributes. The gods interact yeah. with humans, so so that seems to be overall characteristic of that universe itself. And uh, yeah, yes, Maharaj. So I think some some people some people would say that uh, this is an indication of the f- continuing de- degradation uh, of our consciousness. The fact that we we cannot generally communicate with uh, with other species, whereas possibly in in earlier times it would have been uh, would have been somewhat normal and we do meet uh, people who uh, claim and go into quite some detail about how they do communicate uh, with certain animals yeah there are horse whisperer uh, we have yes yeah, yeah I was just gonna say we have a devotee here in Poland she's a fairly a uh, quite well-known trainer of horses um, by a special method of nonviolent training. And she, um, she communicates with her horses, <laughs> oh, okay. horse whispering. Yeah, that's true. And it seems, I think, among the 64 qualities of Krishna is to speak in all languages, including the languages of the animals. Yes. So it seems For that- Krishna, no problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but I mean, not only for it's Krishna, because but if you see the remaining list of qualities, which is described, what he learns, in, I think, is this a list of the sixty-four qualities in the NOD, or is this one of the skills he learns in the Gurukul of Sandipani Muni? Mm. Oh, I guess I always thought they're the same, but um... yeah, yeah it, they could be different. But I thought if it's in the Gurukul list, then it means that that was a skill that. Could be learned at that time. Yeah. So what yeah. you're saying that it's a degradation of consciousness. That's a, that's one very striking way of looking at it. Yeah. And then uh, yes, ma'am. But then you would wonder. I would wonder, uh, is Krishna speaking with the cows in Vrindavan? Krishna does have names for them. Yeah, he has names. He calls them. But does he speak with them? <laughs> That's a good question. You know, there's, uh, yeah, there's, they are more receptions of affection rather than, say, reciprocators in conversation or something like that. It seems so, yeah. Yeah, uh-huh. interesting. Even the monkeys, he doesn't really talk with them. They are, they are there no. to create fun. They're there and he just, uh, he just gives them... Uh, Butter and yogurt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So now, if even if he equates, say, sometimes it said that it was Ram's monkeys. Ram's couldn't. Ram couldn't do anything for them because he was poverty stricken. He was exiled. So now Krishna is returning the favor in this avatar. Now he's making up. Now he's making up for it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah but Ram talks with the monkeys and Krishna doesn't. That's interesting. That's yeah. But then there is also that. But, story. Yeah. Sorry, there is that story of Shara and Shuka. They're both talking about Radha and Krishna's glories. And Shuka are, and Shara are speaking. Yeah. yeah. They're parrots? But they're parrots. Okay. Parrots are talking. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's true. Interesting. Although parrots are usually just parroting. They're usually just uh, repeating what they hear. Yeah. <laughs> mm. So there are... Two more points I had with the Matsya Avatar. See, one is okay. Bhagavatam begins with the question that that this fish, you know, why would Jugupsitam something like that? Then why would uh, this Vishnu appear in such a such a low form? So right. that, so now I I had this question that in the 
in the hierarchy of spe- or in the 8.4 billion species that are talked about it seems fish are placed even below the trees it says jalaja navlakshani sthavara vimshati so like that it goes so mm. and that is sometimes used as a rationalization by some people that you know you can eat fish also because fi- oh, I, see. <laughs> <laughs> i never heard that before okay <laughs> so it's it's interesting that uh, bhagavatam describes that uh, that in that hierarchy which is the lowest species the first manifestation among the dashavataras is in that species and that yes. is uh, that indicates in some ways the inclusiveness that you know, that everything is is everyone is a part of the divine and the divine can manifest anywhere or any form yes and and also one can uh take the idea here that god is ready to humble himself and uh, to you know to to the so called lowest form which simultaneously of course elevates that form because if god is taking that form actually that must be a very uh glorious thing glorious form yeah uh in other words if we were to experience how to say in a more graphic way anyway god <clears throat> appears in the form of a fish and everyone recognizes oh this is the supreme personality of godhead and he's a fish then naturally we're going to look around at other fish and think well i guess they're not so lowly after all <laughs> yeah that's inter- it's interesting often in some ways the bhakti tradition challenges existing hierarchies like many of the devotees are born oh, yes. in lower classes but this is an example of even god appearing in a lower species yes yeah that's He's, uh we we may use the word condescend the yeah. lord descends and he condescends to uh enter such a humble form um because he's of course also teaching humility yeah so here you are using condescend not in the negative sense of being a condescending towards someone it's rather just right. in the sense of accommodating or including yeah yeah okay and then then another point is that later on when you talk about the rescue it seems uh, if we compare it with the noah of ark the noah's ark basically uh, there there is no no such thing as a fish it's just the ship that is built very big and special species are included in that whereas yeah. here it is so it's more of human effort guided by some divine instruction that in their case which saves from calamity but here it is it is not so much human effort i don't think there is any description of satyavrat having to build any ship or anything like that no he doesn't have to build a ship he says um uh, uh matya avatar says a ship will come <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's already built <laughs> yeah so and then so the ship is there and it seems that they the ship is held by to the snout of uh, matya so that the yeah the the you could see the intervention of the divinity is much more over here a much more active presence in rescuing humanity yeah there's a a definite uh, visible pres- presence yeah. yeah so now is there any significance that says a noah is said to be like a progen a significant progenitor and there is a, a recreation or a unification species from there so is there something like that for satyavrat muni also I don't remember there being any any such uh reference yeah. and it's a bit curious because uh, you don't get a sense it's like in Noah's story where there's uh kind of two copies from each species in order to preserve them and you know reproduce uh with Satyavrata it seems like it's just Satyavrata and I don't know is there someone else um 
but he is, of course, Manu. And the general idea is he's carrying over to the next, um, the next, uh, the next period of time, the next kalpa. So there's a sense of, um, there's a sense, I think, of, of Matya serving the purpose of continuity of creation. Oh, okay. One of the jobs, one of the jobs of Vishnu is, or the, the central job of Vishnu is maintenance. Yeah. So he's maintaining the creation. And, uh, but the creation gets destroyed uh, every n- night of Brahma. Mm. And so something has to be, something has to be done to carry over to the next creation. I, yeah. That seems to be suggested. So, but it's not very explicit. So the, the, whether the danger was to Satyavrat Muni himself or to, and Satyavrat is called a Muni, but is he also a king? Is like a Rajarushi or is he a renowned sage? Seems to be more like a king, isn't it? He's a king who's also very austere because uh, the reason he comes to the side of the sea where he meets the fish um, is that he's been fasting and meditating, I guess, on, this, on the bank of the, this uh, sagara or sea or whatever it is. I don't remember. Um, so he's an austere king, <laughs> yeah. but he's also Manu, or he's going to become Manu. Yeah. And Manus are, um, I guess that's the Kshatriya category, isn't it? Yes, Manus. And, uh, you know, at that second level of metaphorical or something, I was thinking that this also applies to how God can apply, God can manifest in the unlikeliest of ways, even like a, inconspicuous way and then he expands so Prabhupada's uh, Prabhupada came to America by the date yesterday itself so Prabhupada's visit to America began with a very inconspicuous he met somebody and he said oh I have a son there and he will sponsor you and then Prabhupada talked with him and Prabhupada forgot about it completely Prabhupada did respond he gave his information and then Prabhupada went from place to place and it seemed that this Mr. Agarwal talked with his son and his son sponsored, he had done it off of many other sadhus and he thought nobody is going to come. But then the mail yeah. came to Prabhupada and then that whole, whole opportunity and it opened up and became bigger and bigger yes. and bigger. So, yes, yes. Mat- Matsya, this is, well, it's not the proper application of uh, Matsya Nyaya, but <laughs> it's a different <laughs> kind of Matsya Nyaya. <laughs> yeah. So. So that is something which you can say carry home. You know, that that Krishna can appearance yes. in the most unlikeliest of ways. Prabhupada could easily have overlooked. Okay, he's just so many people talk about it, nobody yes. will do anything. And uh, Satyavat could also overlook yeah. this fish. But then that yes. proactiveness and then that uh, that resourcefulness, responsiveness, and then that opens such a big door. So now the Krishna consciousness movement is like yes. a, like Matsya just Almost spread all over the universe, all over the all over the world at least. Mm. Yeah, and and this this brings us back to the the rasa dimension because this is wonder, this is adbuta. Mm. Uh, so Matsya, his expansion is is something that the whole pastime, you know, all the pastimes. Uh, of Krishna are wonderful in the sense of being amazing and inconceivable and so on. So this expansion of divine presence, uh, we can say is, is uh, we, we can experience the wonder of that uh, with, with uh, especially with the Bhagavatam. Yeah. That's true. And just while you're talking, it struck me that in one sense, initially it was Prabhupada who took care of Iskon. Iskon was dependent on him. In a sense, it's always. 
but he was taking care of individual devotees yeah. their health and even feeding them and then eventually in his final days there were devotees around him taking care of him speaking the krishna kirtan yeah. and krishna katha to him so it's also in a sense that in version yes. of hierarchy satyavra took care of matsya <laughs> and then matsya took yeah, care yeah. of satyavra <laughs> yeah this yes, maharaj <laughs> very nice yes maharaj so should i quickly can i quickly summarize maharaj in two so three, if you don't mind yes please so it is a very broad ranging discussion and so we started by talking about how we can appreciate the dash the bhagavatam especially the dash avatar so you talked about the yantra four perspectives that uh, the from the vedic perspective how the bhagavatam is the ripe and fruit then the gaudiya perspective how our acharyas elaborated on it then we could talk about the religious or spiritual perspective how we can see from various traditions and then we as ob- we are individual seekers and we bring our own uh, conceptions and our own thought process to it so these are different ways we could appreciate then we talked about how in our tradition so in some ways our discussion went that way in our tradition we looked at how bhakti sanskrit thakur has equated this with the in some way with the the shautas it's more of a correlation rather than a equation just to, uh, then bhakti ra thakur talks about various levels so literal metaphorical and then rasik or yeah aesthetic so then there <clears throat> i talked about you also mentioned about from the other religious perspective for prabhupad correlated for john of arc and st francis of assisi that they also seem to be great saints and it's the bhagavat and there is this correlation in between matsya and uh, and the uh, <clears throat> nose arc where there are some significances some similarities that at least the boat is there and there is a flood so and i mentioned about how there seems to be this that nature seems nature sometimes overwhelms humanity and that's when humanity seeks something higher and you mentioned in the bhagavatam nature is shown as both attractive and dangerous and that parallels the depiction of women also in the bhagavatam and then there is the idea of human choices or human good choices that come through samskaras that can prepare human humans to access the divine when the divine intervenes or when, when the when nature overpowers and one needs the divine then we talked about with the matsya avatar itself we went into the past time how he grows enormously and there is the inversion of vatsalya rasa at first he is protected and then he protects and this is somewhat dif- this is the different this is we could say the opposite of the way normal god consciousness may go that god is our protector and then we bec- then we some devotees they perceive him as their protector as being the protector of god and then specifically with respect to matsya avatar he discussed two three points about how cause fish is considered the lowest but krishna appeared in the lowest species to to help us see that species as sacred and then we talked about talking animals how they don't seem to startle anyone so it seems <laughs> that either the that they the vedic it's not that people were irrational but they were open for super rational for ex, explanations about rationality which are dif- beyond our paradigms our contemporary paradigms of what rationality means there are higher powers intervening and then you mentioned that talking animals is also uh talking with animals is a feature uh, of say krishna's omnipotence and uh, or krishna's training which are and the inability to talk with animals could convey the degradation of human consciousness that because of that because human consciousness is not that broad or receptive so we can perceive only our level of reality not the celestial level nor even the animal level and then toward the end uh, discussed about how the kurma that the matsya he appears in a small form and expands so like that god can manifest in a diminutive or inconspicuous form that's what happened to prabhupad in a small opportunity to go to the west by just a casual suggestion from someone but from that the krishna consciousness movement has as manifested and expanded and this is a source of wonder so which is the that, that rasa the bhagavatam ultimately to enter into through rasa and uh, we can appreciate how majestic prabhupad sheltered his corn and prabhupad was in a sense 
sheltered by his corn and spinal days, just like Satyavat Muni was. So, did I leave out any points, or you want to add something, Maharaj? As conclusion? <laughs> no, I'm just, I'm just impressed with your sharp memory. <laughs> You've remembered all these points. You didn't, you didn't make any notes. <laughs> Yeah, it's a very good. So I this have. was Matsu Avatar. Yes, Maharaj. So, so shall we talk about next time? Shall we talk about Kurma Avatar? Yes, Maharaj. That will be wonderful. This was very stimulating. And I think we also laid a lot of groundwork in today's session. So we could uh, yeah. make further progress and maybe faster progress also. But we'll see that actually yeah. at what pace it goes. Thank you uh, very we much. Can, we can go at any speed. <laughs> yeah, whatever works naturally, whatever evokes rasa or whatever, however the discussion goes. Yes, Maharaj. Exactly. Okay. Thank you very much for your time and very devotional, Thank you. intellectually stimulating discussion. Humble obeisance. Thank you so much. Srila Prabhupada ki jai. Jai. Maharaj ki jai. Thank you. Hare Krishna.